reading is from Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Of course, now I have to change my sermon and add all those things that Jackie just mentioned I'm going to talk about. Oh, mercy. There you are. Let's join together in prayer. Thank you, Father, for gathering us again to celebrate your love shown to us in so many ways. Thank you for the pastors you sent to help us understand and respond to that love. We expect so much of them to be all things to all people, which is an impossible job. We ask you to bless them with strength and wisdom as they serve you and your children. In particular, we ask for your healing and guidance for our pastor Terry during her time of rest and for our old friend Bill Brown, who joins us today, we ask you to give him the words we need to hear and the words he needs to hold in his heart. Open all of our hearts and minds to your message for us. All these things we ask in the name and spirit of your son, Jesus. Thank you. I'm not sure I like the old friend part, but thank you. Long time. Long time friend. Thank you, Alexa. It is good to be back, whether you're in the room or watching us online. I'm going to take a couple of, uh, you know, moments of personal privilege. We're going to say good morning to my brother David and my brother-in-law Ben, who are watching us from Boston. And I'm going to invite everybody else to help me on this next one. Stand up, please. Because I can make you do that, because I've got the microphone. And turn and face the, the camera. And say good morning to Tori, who's in Manhattan watching us. Good morning, Peanut. Right now, she is pulling the covers over her head. Let's see. Yes. You can sit down. Dad. So we had a quiz at, at the earlier service. We'll run the same quiz today, see if anyone's paying attention. Who knows what today is on the liturgical or the church calendar? You can say that louder, or you're trying to get your daughters to say it. I'm not sure which it is, Melissa. It's the first day of Lent. It's the first Sunday in Lent. Lent started on Ash Wednesday. Lent is a 40-day period that leads up to Easter. Historically, in the early church, Lent was the season that was preparing new Christians to be baptized on the day before Easter during the Easter vigil. But today, as we gather in the first Sunday of Lent, we have this reading from Mark. And this reading uh, introduces us to the ministry of Jesus, I think kind of with a bang. Here is Jesus, who nobody's really ever heard of, who comes out of nowhere, comes to the River Jordan, is baptized by his cousin John, and then he is sent into the wilderness where he is tempted. He leaves the wilderness and he begins his earthly ministry of preaching and teaching and healing. And Mark explains all of this in six verses. Like, if you don't have anything else about Mark, what you need to know is Mark is like the cliff notes of the Gospels. He just kind of gives you the basics. So as we begin, Lent, I think this passage is a good reminder that Jesus came not only to announce that the kingdom of God had come near, not just to invite us to repent and to believe, it reminds us that Jesus also came to do battle with the forces of chaos that seem to overtake our lives from time to time. 
And so as we begin, like the early Christians did to prepare for baptism, we now take this season of Lent to prepare ourselves to journey with Jesus to the cross and ultimately to celebrate with Jesus at the empty tomb. And this passage from Mark helps us as we get started by answering a basic question. Why is it that we should listen to Jesus' call to repent that the kingdom of God has come near and that we should believe that? Why is it that we should journey with Jesus towards the cross? And so Mark in these six, seven verses gives us two pretty good reasons why we should follow Jesus. The first reason is Jesus' baptism. It's found when Jesus goes into the Jordan, he's baptized by John, as he comes out of the Jordan River, the heavens are torn open, a spirit like a dove descends upon Jesus, and Jesus hears a voice, we don't know if others heard it, but Jesus hears a voice, that from God saying, you are my son, the beloved. With you I'm well pleased. So we should believe Jesus because here it's announced that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the foundational core identity that Jesus lives into and out of throughout the entire Gospels. And it also reminds us that Jesus is also not alone, that God is with Jesus. I mean, this is completely counter to the way God operated in the Hebrew Scriptures. In the Hebrew scriptures, God interacted with humanity through other people, whether it was through kings or judges or prophets. That's how God interacted with the world. But in the New Testament, in Jesus, God comes God's self. God puts on flesh and lives among us. And this reminds us that nothing is going to stop God through Jesus to fulfill the purposes for which Jesus was sent. And, and from this moment on, everything Jesus is, everything Jesus does, everything Jesus will do stems from that core identity that he is the beloved Son of God. But Mark doesn't stop there. Mark gives us an additional reason why we should believe Jesus, why we should journey with Jesus. Following his baptism, Jesus then spends 40 days wandering in the wilderness among the wild beasts. And not only does this mean that Jesus is in a spiritual place of wandering, not only does it signify that Jesus endures hardships and uncertainty, it also reminds us that Jesus is very much a part of this physical world. God rolls up God's sleeves and gets, God's hand, gets his hands dirty in creation. That God is not a hands-off God. That God is actively and intimately involved in the world God made. So in this very short passage, we're given no reasons to doubt Jesus and every reason to journey with him. And what's significant is, you know, if you read the Gospels, you'll notice that there are times when each Gospel approaches the story of Jesus differently. It's kind of, kind of like seeing an automobile accident. You ask three witnesses, four witnesses what they saw, you're going to get a different story from each one. And often the Gospels are like that, except when it comes to this wilderness story. Three out of the four Gospels all contain a wilderness story. Now John doesn't, because John's kind of a way out there Gospel, but a sermon for another day. Now, Matthew and Luke give us the most details about Jesus' time in the wilderness. It, they describe the kind of Messiah that Jesus is going to be. They describe the temptations that Jesus faces. They give insight into how Jesus is going to make decisions as he moves through his earthly ministry, but not Mark. We'll do a little pop quiz. I like pop quizzes. You, you have to answer these questions, but, but Michelle, you can't answer them because you answered them at the first service. What are the three temptations according to Mark? Who knows what the three temptations are according to Mark? Food, and to make food, okay. Turn stones into bread, that's the, the food. I can, I can move around. What else? to jump from the mountaintop, from the pinnacle of the temple, and, 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 and the angels will, will save him, okay. What's, what's the third temptation according to Mark? Wealth. Wealth. 
It may, that might be in there. Let's see. So we've got food, wealth, and, and uh, the angels will, will protect you. Um, I hate to break it to you all. You're all wrong. <laughs> I don't get to say that often. You're all wrong. And I get to say that because Mark doesn't tell us what the temptations are. It's a trick question. Mark just says in two verses, Jesus went into the wilderness where he was tempted. That's it. I said cliff notes. He doesn't itemize. He doesn't tell us a lot of details. He just gives us the facts. We get bullet points from Mark. Bullet point one that Mark gives us, that Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days. That's it. We know how long he was there, according to Mark. He says in bullet point two, he was tempted by Satan. I'm like, what? What do you mean he was tempted? I, I want some details. How was he tempted? No, nope, Mark doesn't have time for questions. Moving on to bullet point three. He was with the wild beasts. I want to say what again? What do you mean he's with the wild beasts? What does that mean? Was he attacked by them? Was he surrounded by them? Was he fighting them for food? Was he hunting them? Can you imagine Jesus on Survivor? Was this like a survivor moment? Was he making the, the animals, the wild beasts, his pets? We don't know. Mark doesn't tell us. He just moves to bullet point four. He was waited upon by the angels. Again, what? These are like some important things. I want some details about Mark. What do you mean he was waited upon by the angels? Did they bring him food? Did they mop his brow? Or did waited upon mean they stood at the edge of the wilderness, checking their watches, looking at their phones, saying, come on, Jesus, hurry up, get here. We don't know. Mark reveals that we don't know what happens to Jesus in the wilderness, and Mark also reveals that it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter what exactly happened. What's important to understand, I think, as we read Mark, as we read into Mark, is that Jesus identifies with us. He has a shared experience with us. He's been through the wilderness like us. His wilderness experience is different than my wilderness experience, which is different than your wilderness experience, but the commonality is we've all had them. That's all we need to know from Mark. And so as we start this 40-day journey today, as we start in this Lenten season, as we prepare ourselves to journey to the cross, which I think is the hardest and holiest day of our story, Mark reminds us that Jesus did the same thing too. He faced some of the worst experiences of humanity, loneliness, physical suffering, and temptation, and yet he was nurtured by the angels. I mean, that's similar to our reality, I think. That's similar to our experiences. We have beautiful days and we have terrible days. We have days that are filled with joy and days that are filled with sorrow. We have those beastly moments from time to time, finding ourselves cast out into the world that we really don't feel ready for, dealing, for things, dealing with things for which we didn't prepare, wondering if we're even going to survive. There are choices to be made and paths to follow, and we second-guess ourselves every step of the way, wondering if we made the right decision. There are times when we just feel forced into the wilderness. That can be for any number of reasons. We can feel forced into the wilderness through disease or accident, through divorce or estrangement, through memory loss or death, through financial insecurity or the loss of community. The wilderness is a place of intensity, of, of deprivation, where some comforts are just seemingly stripped away. And yet, in the wilderness, other truths can sometimes be revealed. In the wilderness, we learn often the hard way about our limited and fragile identities in nature. But we also discover that our lives are of sacred worth. We learn how much we rely on others for help when we find ourselves in the wilderness. The wilderness is an uncharted territory where our awarenesses can shift and expand, a wild place where we meet ourselves as we really are and discover our fragility and our dependence upon God and upon other people in our lives. Now, I don't know about you, but often 
when I find myself in the wilderness or when I'm talking with people who are in the midst of the wilderness journey themselves, one of the first questions that tends to be asked is, what did I do wrong? How did I get off track? What did I do to deserve to get into this place? And it makes me wonder if Jesus ever had those thoughts. Like when he's in the wilderness, did he ever think to himself, what did I do wrong? How did I get here? Now, we quickly dismiss that and say, well, of course Jesus didn't ever think that. We convince ourselves that he must have known what he was doing. It must have been his idea to go spend some quiet time camping. Because often we think of when Jesus is in the wilderness, he must just be out there camping, cooking some s'mores, and eating starlight mints. <laughs> Breakfast of champions. But listen to Mark chapter 1, verse 2 again. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. That doesn't sound like a phrase you use for somebody who chooses to go. It seems like he had to go, that he didn't really have another choice. The Spirit drove him out. Drove him into the wilderness, that same spirit that tore open the heavens, that announced that you are my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased, drove him out into the wilderness, but at the same time was a gentle presence and loving words. He was tempted in that harsh wilderness for 40 days, but yet in the midst of it, he was also waited upon by God's emissaries, the same God who claimed him at the river. Again, that seems to echo our own lives. We can vacillate between moments of love and acceptance and moments of doubt and fear. We can find ourselves swallowed up in uncertainty and at the same time comforted by those in our lives who love us. And I believe through Mark, Jesus is telling us to lean into the Spirit. Lean into the spirit even when it blows us into unexpected and uncharted territory. Lean into the spirit in times of uncertainty because God won't abandon us. And along the way, there will be moments of blessing even in the midst of hardship. So remember them, cling to them, hold on to them to see you through the challenges. Let them sustain you in the temptation and deprivation. And let those words that Jesus heard ring in your ears. You are my beloved. With you, I'm well pleased. What I love most about that phrase is when Jesus heard it, he hadn't done anything yet. He hasn't done a single miracle He hasn't healed a single person. He hasn't preached a single sermon. He hasn't called a single disciple. He's done nothing, and yet God is still well pleased with him, meaning it's not what we do that pleases God. It's who we are. We are God's beloved. Let the gentle spirit be what drives you also to embrace the suffering of others. Perhaps if you're not the one in the wilderness, maybe you're one of the emissaries of God who's there to bring healing, wholeness, and love to another. And that's the tension of the wilderness. That's the the tension of life, the tension of light and dark, gentleness and suffering, pain and comfort. That's our daily struggle. It's a struggle to hold on to hope in the midst of despair. It's a struggle to hold on to love in the midst of loneliness. And yet, while it may be a struggle, it's possible. Now, I have been through wilderness a few times in my life. I think we can do a quick poll, whether you're watching online or in here. If you're online, nobody's going to see you do it, but you can still do it. Raise your hand if you've been through the wilderness. I don't know about you, but it's not fun. It's not a place I typically choose to spend my time. As I said, uh, you know, I've been through the wilderness throughout my life. Uh, my family, Michelle, Tori, and I have been finding ourselves wandering in the wilderness for the past three years. And we just wonder to ourselves, 
when's enough enough? It started when my mom died in September of 2021. We didn't expect it. I, I remember the phone call like it was yesterday from my dad. And through the whole uh, hustle and bustle of, of being between our home and Lancaster and making all of the arrangements with my family, you get to a point where you move to a place where your life begins to work around that grief. And, and, and you know, I don't think you ever get over those things, but you get to, to, to a place where you learn to live with it and you hold on to those blessed memories. But then my dad's health began to decline, and so I had the, the privilege um, and the honor of being one of many supports to my dad but I got to spend maybe two days a week up in Lancaster taking him to doctor's appointments, being a second set of um, ears, making sure that my brothers were kept in the loop, making sure that things were being cared for, everybody was pitching in so wonderfully. And then in June of 2023, my dad entered hospice on the 11th of June and then died on the 12th of June. Again, was a sad day, but then four hours later, Michelle's dad, who had entered into hospice the same time my dad did, died. And it's just like, really? Two in a row on the same day? Of course, we kind of were morbidly teasing that my dad won. Because you had to laugh because everything else didn't make sense. And so we get through 2023 and we said, enough. 2024 is going to be so much better as we've navigated health concerns and job concerns and life concerns. And so when we come to this first Sunday of Lent and we hear the story of the wilderness, what gets me every single time, we read it every year, but what gets me every single time is that it's the spirit who leads Jesus into the wilderness. That spirit who descended upon Jesus at his baptism, the beloved son, I'm pleased with you, forces Jesus into the wilderness every single year on repeat. And I ask myself every single year, why is the wilderness a part of our journey? Wouldn't it be so much easier, God, for us to follow you if there wasn't all the struggle? I mean, wouldn't that be a much better PR move for God to say, follow me, life will be grand. I mean, it's, it's the experiences we've gone through is the experience I know you've all gone through that tend to strengthen my belief that the wilderness is a bad and dangerous place a place that pushes us to our limits and tests our faith. I mean, that's exactly what Jesus experienced as he wandered in the wilderness for 40 days. He left the comfort of the city for that harsh environment of the desert where he was tempted by temptation, surrounded by the wild beasts, pushed to his limits physically and emotionally and spiritually. The wilderness is a bad and dangerous place and we should avoid it at all costs. That's what I thought thought until I traced the origins of that concept of wilderness, particularly as it's contained in the Hebrew scriptures. When you read the, thing, when you read the Hebrew scriptures, here's the thing about wilderness. The wilderness is a place of formation. It was in the wilderness as Moses was tending sheep that God called out to Moses and called Moses to set the people free. It was in the wilderness that when Moses led the people of the Israelites out of Egypt through the Red Sea and into the wilderness, God, over 40 years, they started in the wilderness as no people, but over 40 years, God shaped them into God's people. They took on a new identity. When Jesus was in the wilderness facing hunger and loneliness and temptation, he formed a new vocational identity. Everything he faced in the wilderness prepared him to deal with whatever the scribes and the Pharisees threw out him in his earthly ministry. The, I've come to the conclusion that the wilderness is a part of our journey because in the wilderness is where and how we learn to trust God. It's where we forge our identity as God's beloved children. And trust me, if following God meant everything was grand, we'd sooner or later forget about God and just think, look what I've done. Everything's grand because that's just the way we work. 
But the wilderness is a time, I dare say, to welcome and renew our relationship with God and our identity as God's beloved children. The wilderness isn't a bad place. The wilderness is actually a holy place. And like the wilderness, this season of Lent is a holy season where we discover our identity in God, where we strip away our usual comfort so that we can hear and see God more clearly. Often people do this by either giving something up or taking something on so they can feel a closer connection to God. The wilderness might feel like a lonely place, but God is there with us, providing a healing and comforting touch in the midst of our brokenness, chaos, and hurt. Let us pray. God, here we are starting down this Lenten path, a path of promise, a path of hope, and a path of refreshment. But often we feel the pull of the mundane. It's a kind of restlessness, not some aberration, but the norm, because we know we live inside in our own contingency, scrunched into time and circumstance, as if we've woken up in the middle of a play that's already started, a, a plot that's already in motion. But we have glimpsed its meaning, its end, and it is glorious. If only we could know our lines, our entrances and exits, the way to move through with grace and beauty and patience, because it's your story. And God, it's our story. We live here in the in-between, bearing the weight of the paradox that simultaneously we see ourselves from the inside in our fragility and dependence, and at the same time from the outside in our heart-bursting possibilities. And honestly, if we're honest, God, sometimes it's miserable. Unless you walk us through this wilderness, oh God. And you do, step by step. And we're grateful that you know the wilderness inside and out. In Jesus' name, amen.